Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 2024 science fiction film, Dune Part 2. Now, before I uh, went to the theater to go see this, I saw Dune Part 1 for the first time. And I was underwhelmed by it, but I still liked the trailers for Part 2. And I was still curious about it. And I was still ultimately excited to see it, despite how disappointing part one was and how boring it was to me. I still thought that Dune part two had potential. And after seeing an IMAX, it had potential and then some. Like, this is not only easily my pick for the best film of 2024 that I've seen to date, but it's also one of the better science fiction films I've seen since Blade Runner 2049. Uh, I thought this was every bit of the spectacle that I personally felt the previous installment wasn't, and a lot of the things that I felt were lacking or I felt could have been done better in part one were completely uh, reimagined and revitalized with this installment. This is one of the best sequels in a long, long, long time. This is one of those rare sequels to me that is superior to its predecessor. It was just an enthralling experience. It really was. Like, I haven't been so enthralled by a film in the theater since seeing, of all things, Avatar The Way of Water. Now, it's directed by Denny Villanueva once again, and this is more like it. Now, the same muted color style and overall um, theme is still present here. Because that's just the look that I guess Denny decided to choose for Dune. But it's not as aggressive this time around. And it does seem like there's more of an attempt to try to create uh, a, a nice variety of visuals with a little bit more color, a little bit more pop. So it's not as monotonous and, and dull to look at visually as the first film was, at least to me personally. Even when it comes to some of the scenes that take place in the desert, which there's a lot of them because a, a good chunk of the focus is on the Fremen. It just feels like a film visually that has more going for it. And it's not just when it comes to the color scheme or the lighting. It also has to deal with the selection of shots. This is more of peak Denny at work here. And... This this film is even more evidence to me that the first Dune was held back by pandemic restrictions or other things. Because this is Denny Unleashed. This is Denny able to just go all out and go gonzo and go wild and go crazy with the direction. With the various different sandworm sequences, with the battle scenes... Uh, with the uh, fights uh, that are really just strong and impactful and just really pack a punch visually and just the sheer spectacle of it all. Like there are numerous scenes in this that are jaw dropping where in the first one, maybe there's a sandworm sequence. Maybe there's one other scene here. It's like four or five, six, like, so many scenes that are just stunning. And yeah, I feel that Denny outdid himself here. Like this is, this is Denny showing that, Hey, I'm still at the top of my game. Uh, <laughs> and witness me that that's, that's, that's what, uh, uh, the direction is in, uh, Dune part two for me. This is Denny being like, I haven't slipped up at all. I haven't lost a, a, a single step watch this. And it's not just the direction that I feel is an improvement with this installment. I also feel the script is much better. 
I think in some part it's because of the fact that this is the part of the book or the story where all the fun stuff happens. <laughs> you know, this is where you get multiple sandworm battle sequences. This is where you get the big hand to hand combat epic scenes of of carnage and destruction. This is where you get the Fade versus Paul Atreides fight. This is where you get all of that. This is also where you get Paul learning to be uh, a Fremen. This is where you get the romance between Paul and Chani. This is where you get the bulk of the mostly compelling and fun aspects of the Dune story. This is where you get all of that. This is where you get the crowd-pleasing stuff. This is where you get the genuine moments of spectacle and awe and thrills. A lot of it is backloaded into this portion of the story. So that's a big reason why this is a better script uh, for me, because there's just so much more going on. The subplots, I think, are better. They've already established these characters in this world and done all this stuff. So now we're just getting to the meat. We're getting, we're getting to the the really high quality meat of the story and we're getting to the moments that are uh, crowd pleasing. We're getting to the really thrilling elements of the story. We're getting to the to, to the moments that I think are the most iconic about Dune. And so because of that, by default, this script is better because of just so much more stuff and elements that the writers can work with and incorporate into the script. But it's not perfect. I do think that there are uh, some aspects of it that I think could have been a bit better. For instance, I think Fade Ralpha, I don't know if the novel is the same way or not. Because I will reiterate this, I've never read the novel. But if it is, it's something that should have been adapted and just changed for this movie. Or even for part of the first film. I think Fade Routha should have been established more as a legit threat. Not just an intimidating, crazy, unpredictable sort of uh, presence. But as a legitimate threat throughout this story to Paul, to his potential empire, to his prophecy. And you get a little bit of that with, uh, you know, the I think it's the Bene Gesserit. I think that's what they're called. I I could be completely wrong. I don't really remember the, the, the yeah, Bene Gesserit. That's, that's what they are. So the Bene Gesserit, the, it's insinuated at some point in part one that they have another plan. They have another successor, potentially, if Paul doesn't work out for them. And so they hint at this person. And then you actually get to see that person in Fade. Uh, but when you when that happens, it seems like it happens during like the last hour of the movie. You get the scene, the Coliseum with Fade, and it's a, a, a just jaw-dropping sequence of just astonishing spectacle. And it does a great job establishing fate as an intimidating presence, but not really as that much of a threat other than, oh, he's, he's, he's imposing, but he does. It's not like, oh, oh no, oh, you know, uh, Paul doesn't stand a chance against this guy. I didn't really get that vibe. And then the fact that he just gets in that fight with Paul and then dies, it just doesn't really have much of an impact. So I feel that, if you established Fade earlier in the movie, or you established Fade at some point in part one, then there would be more of an impact when it comes to the fight between the two. Maybe you, you kind of already establish this character as this just violent presence. And also as this guy who he, he can command an army. Like you establish these kind of things that make it seem like he could be a equal to Paul in many ways. 
And so then when you get to the showdown between the two, they're just, it would just feel like it means more, maybe even have something involving fade killing or, or harming someone that Paul cares for maybe have fade be the one that kills uh one of and I think they did try to do this because I think Fade is the one that I, I believe kills one of the members of the Fremen, but the, the script didn't really show Paul react to that. So it didn't feel like it meant that much. So flesh that out more, make that mean more. So then when you get to the final fight between the two, then it's like something that has higher stakes and there's more emotion behind it other than Paul needs to beat him so he can fulfill the prophecy and become the emperor and, and so on. Also, I feel speaking of, um, not really living up to the full potential when it comes to the build up to things, Paul's final confrontation with the Baron and uh gurney's uh final uh fight with rabin they both suffer the same problem they both are not anywhere near as satisfying as i think they should have been it seems like they're afterthoughts when it comes to the writers so they can move on to the next scene and i think that was a mistake especially when it comes to gurney and rabin you've had almost an entire three and a half hour runtime essentially devoted to building up to this final confrontation between Gurney and Rabin. And it's a five second fight, basically not satisfying, not crowd pleasing, not worth the build up. fight should have been longer, should have had more back and forth. And then when Gurney has that line, it would actually carry more weight. As it is, it, it just feels like it's toothless. It's a toothless one-liner. Now, the same issue also applies to Paul's final uh, confrontation with the with Baron Harkonnen. Harkonnen is just helpless on the stairs and just stabs him in the neck. It's not memorable. It's not iconic. It, it it's nothing. So I think there should have been a little bit more between those two as well. I think maybe that's the point to show that he's helpless and he's not really as, as strong and as good or of a, of a antagonist as he seems to think he is and, and so on, but it just completely undermines the character of Harkonnen and it just makes him into somebody that is just completely uh, pathetic at the end of the day it would be like if at the end of return of the jedi luke faced vader and luke just like easily got vader to his knees in like 30 seconds you'd be like uh vader's that much of a wimp like that that's that's the vibe that you get and the harkonnens the way that they're written they never really come across as like a formidable threat like they sneak attack the Arrakis uh, compound of of the Atreides and tear down the Atreides Empire, but then they get defeated by two hundred Fremen. They get embarrassed. Rabin and his men, Harkonnen gets uh, poisoned and basically becomes uh, 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 not an invalid, but he becomes severely disabled because of it. And when Fade is brought in. Yeah, you know, he he uses artillery and blows up the Fremen's uh, home and and is burning people and is is just a presence uh and physical and and just violent and wild and almost like an animal and still still gets uh killed in the end. I would say he puts up more of a fight than Rabin and Harkonnen did, but still isn't much. So you never really see the, the Harkonnens really establish themselves as like a real formidable, memorable threat. And I think that was a problem too. Uh, and I think that could have been something that could have been really uh, uh, tuned up or 
uh, improved upon when it comes to the script as well. Another thing about the script I think is lacking is the ethereal surrealness of the visions. I think there were too many future visions of Chani in the first uh, part. And it's almost like they overcompensated and were like, no visions. Or like, one or two. And I was like, well, you need to have more visions when Paul drinks the water or when his mother drinks the water. You need to go all out with the visuals. This is the opportunity to be really trippy and experimental and, and just out there. And I think for the most part, Denny really does bring his A game, but it just feels like a missed opportunity that he was not able to show his David Lynch kind of nightmare visuals, which I think really mesh very well with the visions, the hallucinations, so to speak. And it just seemed like instead of even giving it a shot, it just didn't do it at all, which that, that was a little disappointing when it comes to the script as well. But other than that, and other than those other things that I mentioned, I, I still think it's a really good script. Uh, like I said, there's a lot more moments involving action, uh, whether it's a really thrilling sequence involving Chani and Paul trying to blow up some spice harvesters and work together and just barely make it out alive in the end, or the various different battle scenes or the fight with uh, Paul and Fade at the end, or Fade fighting at the Coliseum. Uh, there's just so much more when it comes to the action in this script. There's also more intrigue to me in terms of the Fremen and their philosophy and their religion and uh, Paul living up to the prophecy. The script also does a much better job really providing moments of levity like stuff with Stilgar where it's actually funny and it really makes it so things aren't so serious and dour, which I think really was a problem as well with the first script uh, for, for the first part of Dune. It took itself way too seriously to the point of pretentiousness. Uh, didn't really need random subtext with shots of bulls that don't really add anything other than just random subtext. And there's just so many scenes in, the, in part one that are just super, 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 super serious. Like, this is really, really serious, guys. And there's a couple moments with, like, Duncan Idaho, but other than that, not much. So it just, it just really gets to the point where it becomes boring when it comes to the dialogue. And when it comes to a lot of the other aspects of the script and the plot, because it's just everything's just too heavy and weighed down because of just how serious everything is. Like it's a drama. It's like it's a science fiction film. It doesn't need to be like a drama here. Like we can we can lighten things up a little bit. And that's what happened here. And I think it was for the script's benefit because it made things honestly uh uh leave more of a lasting impression it, it, the the themes and the subtext or the the various different discussions that are made throughout the script about religion and imperialism and colonialism all of this other stuff it, it didn't just wash like right over you uh it it, it kind of seeped in in this time around so it wasn't one of those things where, oh, it just goes kind of way over your head because it's just so much at once and it's so heavy. Here, you know, things are balanced better in terms of moments of levity, so it's not as heavy. And it also makes it so things aren't as bogged down. And the romance angle, I think, was also a plus because I think it's a strong romance. I always felt that the romance between Chani and Paul was a strong suit of, of this story and it's no exception here. I, I definitely feel that gradually they genuinely do start to fall for each other over time. And it's 
sweet and it's charming and and they are a good couple and and you root for them and you want them to be together so when you have that moment of betrayal at the end where paul chooses the prophecy over uh love and a life with chani it's heartbreaking it is it's heartbreaking and it's sad and it actually adds an extra layer of emotion to that uh final sequence that you wouldn't have otherwise and that's something that really was lacking in part one the lack of a genuine emotional investment in things so that's something you definitely do have more of when it comes to the script there's more of an emotional investment in the screenplay because like what did you get in the script in part one for an emotional investment paul getting revenge on his father's death how cliched and generic can you get? And I understand, yeah, the love story is kind of cliched and generic too, but it's as old as time, and it's something that I think more people can relate to because not everybody can relate to revenge in that particular capacity. But everyone can relate to a well-written, strong love story. And this is also where the anti-hero elements of Paul coming to play more. And Paul as a character is just way more fleshed out in this script as well. That's another uh, element of this screenplay that's just so much more of an improvement over the previous uh, Dune because of the fact that Paul Atreides actually feels like a character in this movie, not just uh, a, 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 a vague um, reflection of one. Like, he, he actually feels like a real character here. One more thing I want to talk about before I start uh, discussing the film's cast involving the screenplay is there's a moment during the fight between Paul and Fade where Paul's mother, Jessica, or one of the Bene Gesserit, something happens where Paul is basically manipulated by them to do something and I personally feel that should have been cut out. I, I know that that might be in the novel. If it is, so what? It really undermines Paul as a character. And I don't really think it adds that much in terms of extra intrigue or an extra dynamic to the plot or the script. So we really feel that it's something that should have just been cut out entirely. So then when Paul does anything in the, in the final sequence it's all him it's all his decisions it's all him doing this it's not someone else doing anything and manipulating uh, uh the events i just don't i i think that was a a wrong choice to make narrative wise and it does it undermines paul in the finale it just is like okay well then it's not all him then it's not it makes things less tragic and sad because it's like, well, what is really his decision at this point? If he's this manipulated, if somebody is willing to step in at this moment and take over and force him to do something a certain way, then has this happened before? Is this is this the first time that this has happened or is is this... Uh, a repeated occurrence. It just makes you question things too much. So I, I don't think that needed to be in there. Now, the cast, even though it returns pretty much the same main players as Dune Part 1, I think the performances overall are much better. And I think they're a lot stronger. And especially from the ones that are the two leads in this. Because really, the two leads in this installment are Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya. Timothy Chalamet more than Zendaya, because Zendaya, I just thought she was fine. I didn't think she was fantastic, but she was fine. She did a good enough job. I feel she was at her best when it comes to the scenes where she's playing off of Timothy Chalamet. Not necessarily when she's on her own. I don't really think she's as versatile of an actress yet to really carry anything. 
that makes me kind of worried about the third movie. There's going to be a good chunk of the movie with her just by herself in the desert. I don't know if she's a good enough actress, has enough range to really uh, do all that heavy lifting. But Timothy Chalamet proved that he has that range and he can reach that level. Because in the first Dune, I felt like he was he was a little inexperienced. It's almost like he didn't quite know what he wanted to do yet with this role. And there was this hesitancy and this timidness. And it came across in lines of dialogue. It came across in other ways. Here he grew into the role more. It seemed like he was more comfortable with it. And... I think I think he honestly had more passion for this uh, script because there's much more nuance to Paul as a character. There's more layers. There's the anti-hero aspect. There's the th- the thing of him struggling with the being the the one and being uh, the 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 savior and the messiah and him not wanting to make certain decisions because of these visions of, uh, of people starving and apocalyptic scenarios. And he doesn't want to be the one that triggers all of that. And, but because of those decisions, it causes other dominoes to fall that, uh, create other problems. And you have the stuff with him falling for Chani and then him sacrificing that relationship for the sake of the prophecy by the end of the story and there's just so much more for, for Timothy to work with. There's more physical stuff for him to do, seeing where he tames the sandworm, the various different sequences and where he's involved in hand-to-hand combat or in battle. There's just so much more meat on the bone when it comes to uh, Paul as a character. And as a result, Timothy really shines. He really shines in this film. And I think... He grows into a role as a legitimate leading man and as the leader of this series, you know, as as the as the person who's going to lead Dune as a franchise into the promised land. I thought it was a really great performance, the different layers he added to it, the way that he was able to effectively be a leader and be somebody who commands the screen, which is something that I was worried about after what I saw in the first installment. Rebecca Ferguson, I I felt that she was even a little bit better in this as Lady Jessica than in the first installment, because this is where she becomes uh, a Bene Gesserit mother and drinks the water and she's pregnant and she's got the unborn child that's also got these abilities of a great mother and she's speaking to it and she's got these ever allegiances that she has now and all these other voices in her head. And you also see scenes where she holds her own physically, which reminds you of what she did in the mission possible films. And it's, it's also a much more uh, meaty role for her. Too. There's more for her to work with, more for her to really glean from when it comes to this performance. And, and it really does lead to something that is just a lot more interesting to watch than half the scenes involving her just bawling and crying and all of that. Josh Brolin, more of the same as Gurney. I, I can't really say a whole lot about his take on Gurney. It's fine, but it's, just, it's still the same kind of stuff you saw in the first film. It's fine for what it is. Austin Butler as Fade, I thought he was fantastic. Out of all of the uh, newcomers to this Dune universe and this Dune series, like he's the biggest standout, which really makes it a damn shame that he's not in it that much because you want to see more of him. You want to see more of Austin Butler's psychotic, crazed uh, performance as Fade Rautha. But he's in it for just such a short amount of time. But what a amount of time it is. Like, if you want to talk about a performance where an actor makes the most out of little screen time, this is this is one of them. It really is. I, I, I thought it was just phenomenal. 
uh, Florence Pugh as Princess Erlen. Not quite on the same level as Austin Butler, but still a nice addition to the cast. Handled her, her role well, especially when it comes to the different alliances and the different allegiances that this character has. The, the nature of this character where she's not necessarily uh, aligned to one particular side. How she's conflicted. I think she handled that uh, aspect of the character well. Batista, like I said... Uh, it's, it's Drax with his nipples twisted and his balls twisted and his dick shoved up his ass. Not much of a performance. Christopher Walken, it was nice to see him, but at the same time, it kind of felt out of place in terms of the casting. Like that felt like something that would have been in the David Lynch Dune and not necessarily here. And it's not like he's hamming it up or overdoing it. It's just, Hey, it's Christopher Walken. And because of his age and because of how much he shows his age, the Emperor character doesn't really come across as much of a presence on screen, even though it's Christopher Walken playing this character. If you if you didn't know it was Christopher Walken and it was just some let, let's 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 say that this is an alternate universe where Christopher Walken is not as well known of an actor. He's not as big of a name. He's just kind of a guy that some people are aware of because he's, they think he's pretty underrated, but he he isn't like a household name. Think about it from that perspective and you'll see what I mean. Kind of take the name away, look at it, and it's really not that much of a performance. It's just kind of there. Uh, Leia Sodo as uh, uh, the, you know, the, the Bene Gesserit. Um, one of the Bene Gesserits. She was fine too. I would say Charlotte Rampling though was the one that really has the most impact when it comes to those kind of characters. She's still just as intimidating and creepy and eerie as ever in this. Uh, so Helia Yakub is she, uh, she's she Halki. I think it's she Halki. Or or yeah, something like that. Sorry, butchered the name. I liked her. I thought she did a really good job. She was funny. She had a good charm to her. A lot of charisma. That's the Fremen character I was mentioning when it comes to Fade. I believe he does kill her, but you never really see much of a reaction from from Paul. So it just makes that whole death just feel kind of... Eh. It doesn't really have the impact that I think it should have. And if Paul did have a reaction, it really wasn't something that really stuck with me. But that actress nailed it. I, I really liked her performance. Um, she was another reason why there was a nice bit of levity that was added to the to the story and to the movie. Stellan Skarsgård, like, what can I say about this performance? He's barely in the movie. When he is there, half the time he's just hiding under mud like he's Dennis Hopper in Super Mario Brothers. At least Dennis Hopper had fun playing the Koopa character. Um, you know, King Koopa. Like, what? What did the, the, this perform? I'm going to hide in the mud and I'm going to speak in a gravelly low voice. And then at the end, I'm going to essentially get knocked out of my walker and I'm going to fall on the stairs and I'm going to flop around like a fish. And then I'm going to get stabbed in the neck. It was a nothing performance. I do not get the praise that Stellan Skarsgård gets, especially for this movie. Like he was barely even in the film. What can you say? He was in it for uh, like five scenes. And in one of them, he's pathetically lying there on uh, the steps, like a beached whale. <laughs> like, I mean, it's giving me flashbacks to Marlon Brando when he was doing all these movies later in his career for a paycheck. Like, this is the kind of vibe that I got here. Give me Kenneth McMillan any day over this. This is boring. This is a boring Baron Harkonnen. Uh, Charlotte Rampling. I mentioned her earlier. Just remarkable. Just great. Love her. Uh, Javier Bardem is Stilgar. 
even better here. Like I wanted to see more of him in the first part. You get a lot of him here and it's, it's a lot of fun to watch. Like Javier really, uh, uh, gives it his all with this performance, has a lot of fun with the character, makes the character very endearing in its own right. You have Anya Taylor-Joy, who makes an uncredited cameo as Aaliyah, Paul's unborn sister. That's a pretty good casting. Um, Roger Yuan is, is in it. He's one of the last surviving members of the Trades who gets involved in the Coliseum fight uh, later on in the movie. Uh, yeah, uh, Stephen McKinley Henderson film scenes as Thurfier, but the scenes were not included in the, in the final version. Um, all right, cool. But yeah, the, the, the main draw when it comes to this cast is Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, and Austin Butler. And out of the three of them, I would definitely say Timothy Chalamet and Austin Butler. Those are the ones that really do, uh, stand out the most, but overall, I think it was a better cast. Even though it's made up of most of the same people as in the first part, it just it felt like overall their performances were better. The cinematography by Craig Frazier, I think, is also a step up. I think in large parts because, hey, I'm not just as doing establishing shots here. I'm able to play around in the world of Dune more, play in the sandbox more, so to speak. And it just creates more of a variety of visuals and and usage of lighting and visual effects and all of his other uh, things and, and different elements of the film production. And I think also he really uh, was able to create maybe a little bit more of a cohesive vision in terms of what uh, Denny wanted. And there was no limitations this time either, like with part one, where I genuinely do feel there were limitations on every aspect of the production because of the fact that it was right after the pandemic so there are all these restrictions here not the same restrictions so you can do stuff like this grand coliseum scene you can do all these sequences that are just massive in size and scope that i don't really feel you could have done effectively in the same capacity because of all the restrictions the editing by joe walker i think is wonderful i think it really fits the film well adds so much extra adrenaline to the fight scenes and to the the action sequences in the film and also to other sequences that are just there to provide some spectacle, uh, maybe provide some nice looking visuals, uh, even something as simple as just a scene where someone catches a sandworm in, and drowns it in a lake and then extracts blood from it. The way that that was sh that that was shot as well as the way it was edited it was compelling and it was interesting and it was enthralling to watch and, and that's in large part because of just how good the editing is and just how everything all uh, blends together or everything comes together and fits so well when it comes to this production overall and i have to mention hans zimmer's score in this his score in part one I wasn't as impressed by it would really suck if he gets the Oscar for that score, but not for this score. Cause I think this score is significantly superior. Like there are more pieces in this score that are more memorable that stick with you more specifically the, the, the theme that represents Paul and Shawnee and how that is remixed with the main theme of the first movie. And I think overall this score is just so much tighter and so much more consistent in terms of the quality. There aren't so many moments of distracting over the top throat singing and bagpipes. That's not here. That's not present in this score. Things just flow better uh, musically and it just elevates the film to an even higher level as a result uh and one more thing i want to mention the costume design i want to mention the production design the art direction i don't really always mention that stuff enough in these reviews and i want to mention that here because everyone involved with that aspect of this production really did a fantastic job 
especially the costume design and even with the visual effects i think i think there's a lot of really good looking cgi in this and it seems like there's a fair amount of scenes where they shot it on location or with real sets and even had some practical effects like i think one of the sandworms especially i think the the smaller one i think i believe that was done practically and so it's a film that costs 190 million dollars and it looks like it costs twice that it's quite a feat when it comes to the technical aspects of the production and yeah it's a longer film than the first movie but to me i think it's better paced i think it's better paced overall than the first film because of the fact that there's more things that are happening in this installment and it's not spending so much time with exposition and uh character depth it's it's doing less of telling and instead it's showing which is what you look for out of a film you can you can get away with telling more in a book than you can with a movie it's not as obvious it's not as glaring and in a film it becomes very glaring especially if you overdo it and i think in the first part they overdid it too much here they don't do that as much and i think it really does make the film a, a lot better in a multitude of different ways uh yeah, I thought it was a genuine spectacle. I honestly loved it. I thought it was great. And I'm really looking forward to watching it again sometime. And I can't wait to see Dune Messiah. Thanks for watching my review of the film. And until next time, I'll see you later. See ya.